My name is Dr. Diem Nguyen, and I'm a psychiatrist at the University of California Riverside School of Medicine. And today, we're continuing our video library series talking about prenatal substance exposure. First, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Evan Traeger for the use of these slides. Our learning objectives today will be to learn gross neural developmental processes and neuronal communications of the fetus. We'll talk about basic pharmacology of each substances, including potential mechanism of fetal harm and consequent syndromes and pathology. The substances that we're gonna focus on include nicotine, cannabis, alcohol, opiates, cocaine, and amphetamines. Before we talk about that though, I think we need a basic understanding of what fetal development is. During the first few weeks following conception, gross insults to the fetus are more likely to result in loss of conception. Up until the end of the first trimester, various organ systems are prone to major teratogenic effects. Um, we know certain exposures, such as medications like thalidomide, but a lot of these effects are not predictable. We can see the critical period as the fetus develops, and you, this is a good chart which shows the general development of certain anatomies. Development. Embryonic cells differentiate into primitive forebears of their final identity. Many neurons are found in the adult form during the first few weeks of conception. Then these neurons will migrate to the correct location and begin to form connections. The gross structures that we know of, such as the heart, the arms, the legs, originally are organized linearly, and then they undergo complex movement and folding to become mature cells. Here's a picture of gross brain development. And for neurons, they form multiple synapses, and this is how our nerves connect to each other. Um, and a lot of chemicals are released in these synapses so that we can communicate. The synapses grow as the, we age. They are pruned and developed, and these are the connections that our cells need to make us as a human. So a mother's behavior and physiology can have a very important impact on a child. We know that it changes the placental blood flow, that a poor nutrition for a mother can affect the child. She's the main source of a uh, fetus's nutrition. We know that the mother's health can also affect the uh, fetus. Exposure to violence can affect fetuses, then increased risk of mental illness or increased risk of infection also affect, strongly affect the fetus. So we have to ask in a lot of these studies, who is being tested? Are these women in jail, women in rehab, or is this a community sample? There are many legal issues affecting this question. There was, we know about the crack epidemic in the 1980s, where various states began to require reporting of women who used drugs during pregnancy. The Keeping Children and Families Safe Act was passed in 2003 and required physicians to notify Child Protective Services when an infant is affected by illegal substances at birth or experiencing withdrawals. This type of mandate makes questionable ethics, um, makes the doctor-patient relationship difficult, and it makes testing difficult because mothers might not want to risk losing their child. And in terms of what are the samples that we're actually testing, we usually ask for urine. It's best for detecting recent use of nicotine, opiates, cocaine, and amphetamines. It's not good for recent marijuana use because um, marijuana use can last in the urine for up to 10 days for a regular user. And if you're a chronic heavy user, it can last in your urine for up to 30 days. We can also get the first fetal stool um, and see how the fetus 
was exposed during the second and third trimester. It's controversial. There can be other factors that are in the urine and the newly formed fetal stool, which can contain contamination. So what are other things that we can use to test? Hair. Hair um, can have trace exposure to nicotine, opiates, cocaine, amphetamines. Again, it's controversial because hair can be exposed to a lot of other things in the environment. There are differences in hair variation, color, different treatments. We can also test cord blood, human milk, amniotic fluid, umbilical cord issues, but these are a little harder and more expensive and rarer to test. So how many women actually use substances during pregnancy? Um, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health uh, showed that of approximately 67,000 community dwelling members, 12 or and older, they grouped the data into two years and reported drug use among pregnant women 15 to 44 years of age. And here's what they came up with. Um, for pregnant women with any illicit use between 2012 and 2013, was reported at 5.4% and they divided it by age and then we see that it's heaviest in younger women between the ages of 15 to 17. And we break that down even further. In terms of alcohol use, uh, pregnant women are at 9.4%. And in terms of binge drinking, which is heavier alcohol use, 2.3%, um, but heavy consistent drinking reported at 0.4%. What's interesting with the alcohol data was they broke it up by tri trimester. So how much were they drinking in the first trimester versus the second trimester and the third trimester? And it, you can see that it's heaviest during the first trimester at 19%. Um, but reported to be decreased significantly by the second and third trimester. What about nicotine use? 15.4% um, of pregnant women reported nicotine use, and in terms of age, you can see that it's correlated higher um, with women who are, can legally do uh, report it, 18 to 25-year-olds at 21%, and it is more commonly used in the first trimester at 19.9% reporting. So let's start with that then. In terms of tobacco exposure, what does that mean? Um, tobacco smoke has over 4,000 compounds. 30 are associated with health outcomes and the most common thing in tobacco that we concentrate on is nicotine. It is found in the fetal fluid and tissues and there are episodes that we can attribute to nicotine toxicity. We know that it affects fetal blood flow because we can trace the hypoxia and poor nourishment in a fetus. It can affect the brain metabolism, neurotransmitters, and subsequent development. For nicotine, we know that there is associations with low birth weight. It seems to be a dose-dependent relationship, so higher doses of nicotine, lower birth weight. The growth restrictions do seem to fall off by two years of age, um, and there's also some data for an increased risk of obesity in children. We know that there can be changes in orientation, um, autonomic regulations, and muscle tone, and they're also commonly to be found to have oral facial clots. There can be impulsivity and attention problem, including hyperactivity. There are reports of increased negative and externalizing behaviors in children. And as they get older, there seem to be higher rates of delinquency, criminal behavior, and substance use as they become adults. We, there are some um, cases of learning memory issues and possible lower IQ. So what about cannabis? 
like nicotine, there are many different compounds with different pharmacology. We know that the use of, uh, of cannabis among pregnant women increased by more than 100% from 2002 to 2017 in the United States. And in August of 2019, the Surgeon General of the United States issued an advisory against the use of marijuana during pregnancy. So what are the effects on the fetus if a mom uses marijuana? We know that cannabis can alter developing brain systems. It uh, affects neurotransmitters and uterine blood flow. The fetuses have an increased startle and tr um, tremor response, and there is d reduced birth weight. Then what are the long-term um, effects of early cannabis exposure. There is a 2019 study um, called ABCD, Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development, which showed the outcome of 11,489 children who were prenatally exposed to marijuana. All associations with exposures happened before um, the maternal knowledge of pregnancy was not significant when you consider other confounding variables. What's interesting though, is marijuana use after a mother knows of her pregnancy was associated with increased offspring psychotic experiences, including ex internalizing and externalizing experiences, attention problems, thoughts, uh, social and sleep problems. And then we know that there are reduced cognition, reduced birth weight, and possible changes in the brain structure itself. Next, we're moving on to alcohol and the effects on the fetus. We know that alcohol crosses the placenta and has potential toxic effect on the placenta itself, which is what is used to feed the fetus. So there is direct teratogenic effects during embryonic and fetal phase of development. Um, their mom, who is a heavy drinker, will get no significant calories from alcohol and this is translated directly to the fetus so we know that there's fetal nutritional deficiency. Um, fetal hypoxia can also occur as less nutrients get across that includes less oxygen so this can affect brain neurotransmitters, um, the morphology of the brain, and the neurons development. So fetuses show very poor neonatal response to stimuli and very low arousal. Then when the baby is born, we um, know that fetal alcohol syndrome can be very common. There are distinct um, things that we look for when we diagnose fetal alcohol syndrome, including growth deficiency, distinctive facial features, small eye opening, there's a smooth uh, valtrum, and a thin upper lip. There's cranial nervous system damage, and we usually have a known or suspected alcohol exposure in fetus. And there are long-term consequences to alcohol use. Um, there's evidence of poor growth with fetal alcohol syndrome. There are attention problems, adaptive behaviors, problems into adulthood. There are disrupted school experiences, increased criminal behavior, and increased substance use. Children report poor memory and executive function. And in fact, fetal alcohol syndrome is known as the single greatest preventable cause of intellectual disability. Next, we move on to opiates, which bind to endogenous opioid receptors, which are found widely in the brain, the spinal cord, and even in our digestive tract. It, so it crosses the placenta easel, very easily, and like I said, the placenta is what nourishes the fetus. So opiates can decrease brain growth and cell development, and we see that with decreased birth weight and some um, neonatal withdrawal. So for the all symptoms that correlate to adult withdrawal symptoms, babies can have sweating, irritability, diarrhea, increased muscle tone, feeding problems, seizures immediately after they're born. And in fact, this could be pretty dangerous and require hospital management. Some um, newborns will require bu buprenorphine, also called Suboxone, when combined with Naloxone, which is a safer alternative to slowly wean them off opiates over time. 
and reduce some of that withdrawal effect of suddenly stopping um, opiates. So what are the long-term consequences of opiate exposure? We see hyperactivity and short-term attention span in toddlers. And as they get older, they tend to have memory and perceptual problems, but no strong evidence exists for developmental delay right now. Next, we move on to cocaine. Cocaine binds to dopamine transporters. It blocks the reuptake of dopamine and dopamine, more dopamine remains in the synapse. What that means is it can cause vasoconstriction and reduce fetal uh, blood flow, which means again, smaller growth uh, restrictions. The main thing with cocaine, growth restrictions. We do also see a decreased behavioral and autonomic regulation, including irritability, very label mood, their mood can switch very suddenly as a newborn, and they're not as alert or as oriented. And what are the long-term effects of cocaine? In general, it's believed that it co- long-term effects of cocaine predict negative behavioral problems in children ages three to seven. Uh, the studies there are, here are inconsistent. What we do see is that teachers and caregivers often report poor attention span, more impulsive behaviors, and soft reports from children indicate increased um, ODD and ADHD. So there is some evidence for deficits in executive functioning, including visual motor ability, attention, and working memory. Next, we move on methamphetamines, which is pretty common in our population in Riverside. It can cause inhibition or reversal of reuptake pumps for dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. So it's a pretty dirty drug. Like cocaine, it's a vasoconstrictor, which means reduce fetal blood flow, reduce intrauterine growth. So... Again, you know, for fetuses, there is a very well-documented poor fetal growth. There's no evidence yet for increased risk of birth defects, though, but there is some evidence for poor movement quality of the fetus, decreased arousal, and increased fetal stress, which translates to delayed or incomplete development of motor skills during childhood and incomplete or delayed development of mental and intellectual abilities during childhood. There is uh, some information about methamphetamine withdrawal in a newborn. There was a study of 300 infants with in utero exposure, which showed 50% had some withdrawal symptoms, but only 4% required active management. So not as strong as opioid withdrawals. For long-term effects of methamphetamines, we see poor growth, lots of externalizing behaviors, um, disruptive behaviors, peer problems, and there is some data for a decreased IQ. Here's a summary of everything we talked about. I know it's quite extensive, and so this is a good chart to refer back to. But the main take home points are only alcohol exposure is linked to a defined clinical syndrome and that prenatal drug exposure is a very complex process. The best predictor of poor outcomes appears to be parental drug use after birth. So yes, it's important to keep in mind what the baby might have been exposed to as a fetus, but if the parent continues to keep using the drugs after the baby is born, that has significantly worse outcome for the continuity and the development and the progress of a child. Thank you so much for listening to me and um, walking us through this whole process. And these are the references for our slides today.